This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we do focus on our gospel lesson in which Jesus not only states his commitment of carrying out the work of saving us and rebukes Peter, but he also tells us um, how we are to follow him and what is involved with that. We read once again from the first part of our gospel lesson. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, this event in the ministry of Jesus is a potential turning point in his ministry. And I only say potential because it never really happened. But there were those times when Jesus was tempted not to go through with the plan that had been prophesied in the Old Testament and which had God, given, God had given him to carry out. Uh, for example, immediately after Jesus was baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, instead of beginning his ministry right away, he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to contemplate what it is he was going to do, but also to be tempted by the devil. And during that time, the devil is, is trying to get Jesus to think of or plan and carry out an easier way out. And if you look at those temptations, it's really about trying to save the world, which Jesus would not have been able to do if he gave into it, but trying to save the world by not suffering and dying on the cross, by doing something more appealing. But Jesus did not waver. He resisted each and every one of those temptations with the Word of God, and after those 40 days, strengthened by the angels, he went out and began his three-year public ministry. Some time into Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist, who had been the forerunner, prepared people's way for Jesus, baptized Jesus. John the Baptist did not just disappear. He continued to proclaim repentance and the kingdom of heaven being near and pointing people to Jesus. And he continued to call sin for what it was, no matter who was committing the sins. And John the Baptist, he spoke against the practice of one of the Herods, who had taken his brother's wife to be his own wife and was living with her as his wife, even though she was still married to his brother. So his adultery was called into account by John. Well, Herod didn't like that, so he had John the Baptist put into prison, and Herod's brother's wife didn't like that either, so when she had the opportunity, she tricked Herod and had him give the order to have John the Baptist beheaded. And some thought, well, if they're going to do that to John the Baptist for what he's preaching, and Jesus is preaching the same type of thing, calling sin for what it is, calling people to repentance, but also assuring people of forgiveness who did repent, that if that happened to John the Baptist, maybe that would happen to Jesus too. And Jesus did leave that area where it was the threat was there, but he never quit. He didn't say, well, I'll just go do something else because I don't want to be having that happen to me. But there was probably a little bit of temptation there. Later on, after the events in our text, as Jesus was just hours away from fulfilling what he had said, recall how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prayed to his Father, if it were possible for me to save the world in a, in a different way, um, but not my will, but your will be done. If the only way this can happen is if I drink the cup, if I suffer and die, then, then I will do that. But there must have been some temptation there, that last ditch effort on the part of Satan to get Jesus to back out at the last moment. But Jesus didn't. And so when he says, I must go and do these things, and Peter responds in what on the surface seems to be the counsel of a man who, who deeply respected Jesus and loved him and had Jesus' safety in mind. 
and say, Lord, this should never be that it, it seems as though Peter's doing that out of really love for Jesus. But Jesus recognized it for what it was. It was an insidious plot on the part of Satan himself to use one who was very close to Jesus to try to get him not to carry out the work that God had sent him to do. And seeing it for what it was, Jesus turns to Peter and rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. Not name-calling Peter Satan, but actually addressing the one who's behind all this. You do not have in mind the things of God, which is saving the world through Jesus, but the things of men, which is temporal safety as opposed to enduring hardship. But Jesus shows his resolute determination to carry out his work responding to these different temptations and always moving forward. And this was in keeping with what had been prophesied 700 years before that. When you read through the prophet Isaiah, there's a lot of very rich prophecies concerning Jesus. And in Isaiah chapter 50, you have Isaiah writing, but it's really the words that Jesus would later be saying or, or living. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. To know the word that sustains the weary. We think of how Jesus taught him. He rests to the weary in comfort. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. And, and Jesus came to proclaim the Father's word, and he would hear that and have that part of him and instruct. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. And then we can picture Jesus on trial. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. As the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. Flint is a very hard rock. And that's the determination that Jesus has. And I know I will not be put to shame. Luke tells us in chapter 9 of his gospel, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, talking about his sufferings and death, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He would not let anything dissuade him, not even Peter, not even Satan. And the writer to the Hebrews tells us that when we strive to take up our cross and follow Jesus and to deny ourselves and to be willing to lose everything for his sake, that when we need help doing it, and we do need help doing that, we have to consider several things. He starts out saying in Hebrews chapter 12, referring back to the chapter 11, which is about the heroes of faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So, Consider how those, all those people in chapter 11 lived by faith, did not always see what had been promised, but always looked ahead. But then the writer to the Hebrews says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so you will not grow weary and lose heart. So he's pointing back to how Jesus endured the cross because he knew what was coming. He knew that he would pay for our sins, that he would be raised to life, that he would ascend, that he would be at the right hand of the throne of God. And so Jesus is the, well, he, he does this for our salvation. We see his determination. And that's the main thing but he also can be used as an example for us to look to, to give us encouragement, not just from the example, but from the power that Jesus has in our lives. And we do need Jesus' power in our lives. Because right after Jesus rebukes Peter, he says something to his disciples, which is said on other occasions in the Gospels. And it's, as you read through the Gospels, you see there are certain things that Jesus will see. He'll see like... Um, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. You can see that in different places. Or the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You see that in other places as well. You see the Lord's Prayer being taught several times. So Jesus has certain stock phrases that he uses. 
And this is one of them. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So what is more important, the things of this world or our eternal soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What is more valuable, the things of this world or our eternal soul? And Jesus, we know what the answer is. Here Jesus says to take up our cross and follow him. Now, he's not asking for something that's easy. He's asking for something that can be very difficult, which takes determination, which takes sacrifice, which takes commitment, which takes unwavering faith to follow Jesus. And he, he's not saying it's going to be a pleasant experience, although there are many blessings for those who do follow Jesus. Jesus teaches us it can be a difficult thing. And we know what the picture is there of, of taking up a cross. In the Roman world at that time, uh, as a way of punishing evildoers and as uh, a deterrent. The Romans believed that capital punishment was a deterrent, although it didn't really deter as many people as the Pope. But, but their, way, their capital punishment by crucifixion was not swift. It was not relatively painless, like a lethal injection or for example, it was meant to cause extreme pain and to last for days, and also to publicly humiliate the person who was being crucified. This was not done secretly. This was not out in the open. Everybody could see it on the main roads. And it was done to inflict as much punishment as possible to, to teach that this is what happens when you rebel against the authority of the Roman government. And everybody knew what Jesus meant when he says to take up your cross. He didn't mean we literally have to be crucified, but he's saying this is not going to be an easy thing. This is going to be difficult because it's going to war against those things which we seem to enjoy all too much. It's going to war against um, all those wonderful things that Satan promises and all those things that he says, well, you just do that and, and things will be better. Like when he said to Adam and Eve, you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. God's keeping something from you. Well, that was a lie. And other things that Satan, um, well, even when he's tempting Jesus here through Peter, you know, it's, you don't have to die on the cross for these people. Maybe, maybe do it some other way. Or just, just forget about it. Or the world. The world has so many temptations, so many things that, that are supposed to be appealing to us, uh, uh, wealth and ease and pleasure and, and just soaking up the sun, as it were, and then our own sinful flesh, our sinful flesh really enjoys a lot of things which are not good for us. To say no to those things, and to say no to those things when more and more the world is saying, there's nothing wrong with that, and is tolerant, and even promotes those things, it is difficult for us to say no to temptation and to follow the Lord, even though by following the Lord, we are greatly blessed. And, and not just with eternal pleasures at God's right hand forever in heaven. God really does bless those who follow him during this life with blessings during this life. Love, joy, peace, patience, understanding, spiritual gifts, the assurance of the forgiveness of sins, of knowing that we have a God who loves us, protection, just wonderful blessings. But we don't always see it that way, and so we, we think, well, you know, if we follow God, it's, it's going to be harder and it'd be easier just to, to give in. And so it, it feels like a cross when we have to be good, as it were. There's another factor to it as well, and that is that we don't see this much in our culture, but Jesus was already experiencing it. He warns his disciples that they would experience it at the hands of the, the Jewish religious leaders, but as Christianity spread into the Roman world, 
They were also going to suffer this on the hands of the, the unbelieving Romans, the pagan Romans, and that is when people are, are living for Christ and following Him and trusting in Him and, and saying that there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved and that this is how we are to live for God, that those who don't agree with that, they will persecute the Christians. They persecuted Christ for what He was teaching. He warned His disciples that if they do this to your teacher, they're going to do it to you as well, and they did. And as the Christian church spread, horrific things were on the horizon. And so the writer to the Hebrews who were suffering and being tempted to, to give in, they were being persecuted, not yet to the point of shedding blood, that, that would come to some Christians, but they were enduring that cross, the cross of Christian suffering for the sake of faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus, who resolutely endured all things to save us from our sins, he calls upon his disciples to have that same type of commitment and to put their God first, even in the face of these temptations. Historically, even Christians seem to like to take the easy way out. They, they like to have the joys of this life and the pleasures of this world and their faith in Christ. And so what has happened is that religion has become somewhat compartmentalized. And let me explain that. And I'm going to explain that by referring to a, a very committed Christian who lived in Germany. Uh, he's a Lutheran pastor, and he lived there um, primarily, what I'm going to reference is the 1930s through 1945. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, was a very uh, devoted follower of Christ who really contemplated the cost of discipleship and what it meant to take up your cross and follow him. And he made these observations in the 1930s about uh, Lutheranism and, and really probably all of Christianity, but he was Lutheran, so he talked more about Lutheranism. But Lutheranism in Germany in the 1930s, he says, what's happened is we've compartmentalized our religion, um, so what we do is we, we build temples for God, we build churches for God, and, and that's where you go to worship God and to hear His Word and praise and sing hymns and, and encourage one another. And, and that's where God is. God's in His temple. God is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. It's an Old Testament psalm verse. And so that, that worked out in, in a way, you know, so you're a, a Christian in Germany and you want to practice your faith, well, you go to church on Sunday. And you go there and you do the things that people do in church on Sunday. And you do that for an hour, but it better not be more than an hour. And, um, well, unless you have Sunday school or Bible class, you have two hours. And so you, you take care of that. You've done your thing. You've shown your devotion to Jesus Christ. You've worshipped Him. You've heard his word. You've sung praises. And even though you believe in Jesus Christ the rest of the week, he's, he's kind of out of sight, out of mind, so you can kind of follow the ways of the world. But then next Sunday you go back to church again and kind of take care of any sins you committed during the week. And, and he said that's what was happening in Germany. Sound familiar? Is that how some people operate today? Is that sometimes how we may operate? Do we compartmentalize our, our faith? That we, you know, it's a Sunday morning church, or it's, it's praying at meals, and, and maybe a little Bible reading during the week, but maybe we're not focusing on what it means to follow Jesus the rest of the week. There's always that temptation. And so, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about that, he spoke about that, and he was always trying to encourage his fellow Germans, you know, follow the Lord, make, make the Lord a, a, a vital part of your life, no matter what's going on, and, and, and not just on Sunday morning, and, and follow the scriptural principles. Well, he was in Germany in the 1930s, and he saw some really bad things that were going on, and um, he spoke against those things, and he preached against them, and he wrote against them, and he realized that if you continue to do that, 
things weren't necessarily going to go well for him. And so he had an opportunity, a possible turning point in his ministry. Okay, so in the late 1930s, 1939, he's a very well-known person at the time. He's invited to preach at a university in uh, United States. I almost said Wisconsin, but I'm sure it wasn't Wisconsin. But he's in the United States, and he's preaching about the cost of discipleship. And he knows what's going on in Germany in 1939. And he had a chance to stay in the United States, where he would be relatively safe. Or go back to Germany, where he was determined to keep on proclaiming, following Jesus in light of everything that was going on, and would probably suffer great um, physical harm. So what do you do? I, maybe he was saying, I, I must go back to Germany and suffer many things at the hands of sinful men and be arrested and put to death. But he didn't have, he didn't know that was going to happen. He couldn't prophesy. It wouldn't have been for the same reason that Jesus did those things. But he, he knew it was more dangerous. And so he goes back to Germany anyway. Because that's where his people were. That's where his ministry was. That's where he believed he had to go to, to follow the Lord. And it was one of the last boats or ships going back to Germany because, you know, about that time, there, there wasn't a war between the United States and Germany yet, but everybody knew it was coming. And there was going to be, and so in 1939, it's like, you, you don't go visit Germany, you don't go move there and vice versa. So it was, but the last, the last boat, he, he takes the last ship to Germany. And I didn't do all the research, you know, just how involved was he, how, how dangerous was it for him for the next six years, but, or five years, well, six years. But in 1944, something happened which was a turning point in many people's lives, something that certain people were hoping was going to be a turning point in history, and that was the attempted assassination of Adolf Hitler. It wasn't the only attempted assassination of Adolf Hitler. It was the one that was had the chance of being the most successful, however. So on July 20th, 1944, Hitler's meeting with his staff, and he's at the Wolf's Lair, and this guy comes in, if you ever seen the, or read about Valkyrie, that's the event. So the German general comes in, sets down a briefcase, makes an excuse, I gotta go and do something. And when he leaves, what happens? The briefcase explodes. It was an attempted assassination of Adolf Hitler, and it was not successful. Adolf Hitler survived, but he was upset. And that's, and, and so, um, the way that relates to Dietrich Bonhoeffer was that he was associated with that. I'm not saying that he was part of the planning. You didn't have to be. If you were associated in any way, it was bad. So uh, he was arrested, he was put into prison, and right before the war was over, in April of 1945, and, and the war would be over in May, um, he's executed. And the Germans said, well, you know, the war's almost over, let you go. They didn't. They, they hung him with a piano wire, I think it was. Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't just talk about following the Lord and, and being willing to sacrifice. He did things that showed his commitment to Jesus, and he lost his life. Believing that God had greater blessings for him because of what Jesus Christ had done so many years before. Because Jesus Christ had resolutely gone to Jerusalem, even though he knew what was going to happen there, and willingly gave his life on the cross. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about that, he preached about that, you can still read his words today, and he died trusting in Jesus. The disciples, how did they respond when Peter tried to stop Jesus, and Jesus says, no, I'm going to go. One of them said, let's, let's go with him, so we may die with him. And they went along with Jesus. They struggled at times, as it had been prophesied, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So when Jesus was arrested, they all fled. After Jesus was put to death, they were hiding in the upper room until they saw him on Easter Sunday. They had their struggles but they also had God's help. And they did deny themselves and take up their cross 
and follow Jesus. And they inspired others to do that as well, always pointing to Jesus, not their own examples, but pointing to Jesus. And Peter wrote several letters that we have. John wrote the gospel in, in several letters, and, and the book of Revelation, which, is, which are all sources of encouragement. So we see how they responded. What does God want us to respond? Because it wasn't meant just for those 12 disciples to deny themselves. It's for all Christians to put others first, to trust in God and not to give in to sinful temptations. What is expected out of us? We may never be persecuted the way the early Christians were, be arrested and put to death like Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. But there are opportunities for us to, to serve the Lord and to do that with a willing heart and to expect blessings and to benefit other people as well. And St. Paul writes about that. Now, Paul was not one of the original 12 disciples. He's called to be an apostle later on. But he certainly endured a lot of things and, and went through a lot of suffering following Jesus. And when he writes to, in, well, in Romans, for example, in our earlier lesson, you can read through this and, and you can read it as a commentary on what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God, this is our spiritual act of worship. It's not relegated to an hour or two on a Sunday morning. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So don't give in, with the, give in to what the world is saying all the time. You will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't think more of yourself than you should. Think of yourself in sober judgment with the measure of faith God has given to you. And then, as you look at your life, as you look at the talents you have, the abilities that you have, and, and elsewhere it says we can actually work on improving those things. You know, just because you have an ability doesn't mean you can't practice it and work at it. Use the abilities that you have to serve God as living sacrifices, and use the abilities that you have to serve one another. And so in that list, Paul says, if you have this ability, then use it. He doesn't expect us all to do the same thing because we don't all have the same abilities. But the abilities that we do have, which are gifts from God, we have to use those not to make a big name for ourselves, but to benefit other people. Now some people have looked at that and it's brought about a, a huge turning point in their lives. They were going down one path and they were being very successful and then they were just gathering together a lot of worldly things for themselves and they came to realize, you know, it's not all about me. It's about God. And it's about other people. And how am I going to use these abilities to benefit others? And this is just kind of off the top of my head. It's not prepared, but uh, there was this guy named uh, Carnegie. And he made an immense amount of wealth. And he got to a certain point in his life where he realized that maybe all that wealth isn't just for me. Maybe I should use that wealth to benefit other people. He did one thing that I'm thinking of that he, he funded a library in every state in the United States. Because he thought that going to the library and, and reading books and having a place to research is a good thing for other people. I think we think of Carnegie Hall more often than libraries, but the, so he's, he's up one of those people that uh, benefited. Well, we'll never have as much money as Carnegie. Maybe never establish a library. But we have gifts from God. We have abilities. And we have a Lord who has saved us and who calls us to follow him. May God always lead us to deny ourselves and use what we have to serve our God and to serve others. Amen.